Nadia Levine, the Chief Executive Officer of Research Australia, which is the national peak body for all of health and medical research. So from basic research at one end of the pipeline all the way through to translation, health services, and of course, the people we do this for, the patients and consumers at the end of the day. So what's our mandate? Uh, well, our vision is health and prosperity through Australian research and innovation, and that's all the opportunities uh, that Australia's incredible health and medical research uh, and innovation actually bring for us, uh, not only from a health point of view, uh, but also from an economic point of view. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about things like developing, uh, you know, better ways of delivering care, vaccines, pharmaceutical products, med tech, if you like, through to creating the jobs of the future moving us away from a reliance on resources and creating industries of the future using this incredible expertise that we've got from, as I was talking about, the whole of the, the health and medical research pipeline. So that's a great question. Uh, and the key is we've got incredible health and medical research in Australia. We also have some really good innovation uh, and manufacturing opportunities. And that's exactly what it is at the moment because they're opportunities as opposed to being put into practice. And there is some concentration and some activities and some efforts uh, by both the Commonwealth and state governments to, to put those ideas to work, if you like. Uh, right now, we've got about 23% of Australian uh, uh, investment Commonwealth spending into uh, health and medical uh, research R&D. Uh, how, you know, how does that compare? Well, it's okay. It, it does lag slightly compared to other countries that we would uh, consider comparing ourselves to uh, in the OECD. Um, but I think more so than quantum, and quantum's obviously part of it, the research funding landscape is, is complex, it's messy, it's complicated. And I mean, you know, if we have just a look at the at the Commonwealth level, funding comes from many portfolios, and we're certainly not saying that that's a bad thing. But it means that there is a lack of visibility across uh, portfolios, across where that funding is. So you see a lot of duplication. You've got multiple research teams working on the same or perhaps similar research that's all being funded. Uh, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of time, it's a lot of money. And uh, from a Research Australia perspective, we're saying, well, it's just crazy to, to duplicate effort, both in terms of time and money, and why would we do that? So for us, it is about, if you like, if you think about it as a baton race, you know, that you've got a team that's got the first baton, you're running the first part of the race, you move on to the second, you hand the baton on, uh, and so on. And so that's what we're encouraging, is a, is a more streamlined approach, a national approach, if you like, that says, where is Australia's research? Who's doing the research where? Who's funding it? And then you overlay that with what is it that we need for our population needs? What kind of research do we need for the medical outcomes we're looking for? And then we have a look at it from an innovation point of view. How can we monetize this? How can we commercialize this? How can we take these incredible ideas with this incredible research talent that we have in this country and turn it into industries, jobs of the future? Um, what does that look like? And so what we're saying is you've got this highly complex system that's got all of these pieces of funding all over the place, but there doesn't seem to be a really good handle on how well that's going. Is it working well for us? And in some cases, we might find that it is. So what we're saying is it doesn't have to be perfect. It can still stay a little bit complicated, and a little bit messy, but what's the national strategic approach to making sure that we get the most out of the public dollar, the public investment, and it's significant that we're making into health and medical research. Uh, we're saying that things need to be addressed like indirect costs. So when uh, a researcher gets grant money, that grant doesn't cover the entire cost of research. There's a component called indirect costs. And that means that the institutions that they work for, whether it's the uh, medical research institutes or the universities, they have to find that other bit of funding to complete that, uh, that grant uh, amount. And you might say, well, that's all well and good, but what it means is it starts putting more pressure on these organizations and then they start choosing what it is they are and not going to fund which of course is their right, but what does that mean from a national interest point of view? So we were really lucky with the Medical Research Future Fund, $22 billion fund, fully capitalised, unbelievable opportunity for Australian researchers. Uh, but again, it is creating a bigger hole of these indirect costs that we need to be able to, to look at and fund holistically. 
Not only that, we've got a real decline in uh, funding from our uh, upstream funders, which would be the National Health and Medical Research Council, uh, the uh, ARC, the Australian Research Council, and we're saying that we would like to see a real increase, a sustainable increase in ensuring the future of these funding bodies, uh, that they can really look to not only continue to fund great research, but fund the full cost of research. I don't think there is, uh, and I don't think that's anybody's fault. It's just a, a symptom, if you like, of what I was describing before, which is this messy and complicated funding system, where you've got the Commonwealth funding certain programs, you've got the states funding certain programs, you've got philanthropy, uh, charity, foundations, uh, private capital funding other bits and pieces of it. Now, that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to have multi-portfolio approaches, multi-funding approaches, that's what we need. But what we need to know is how is it all fitting together? Otherwise, we've got this duplication uh, of both effort uh, and money. And this is something, certainly as we move into uh, the really serious global economic headwinds, that no country can afford to fritter away any amount of funding. And I guess it's about really understanding, uh, you know, well, first of all, to reverse the decline uh, in funding that we're seeing uh, in our, with our funding agencies, the, the NHMRC and the ARC. So we need to do that first. We also need to get a handle on what research is being funded where uh, and determine if that is, as I said, the right, right mix of research activities. Is this what we need as a nation from a, from a health outcome? Uh, but then also from a building uh, a capability uh, situation uh, or type of approach from building what, what are the industries of the future that we need what are the jobs of the future it's about what kind of workforce do we need for the future so it's the starting point if you like which is why part of Research Australia's advocacy position and uh, as far as the call on the budget is concerned is let's baseline it doesn't have to be perfect. We don't have to itemize every single piece of research, but let's understand what research is being funded and done where and by whom, which gives us the starting point to make those bigger decisions around what research we would fund going forward, and then the opportunities that would come from that research into industry, commercialization, export opportunities, all of these incredible bits at the other end of the pipeline, which we also need to focus on. Well, I think the pandemic and climate change certainly changed the focus or sharpened the focus, if you like, uh, made us realise that we needed to uh, make ourselves more sufficient from an economic point of view, so have an economy uh, that is able to deal with and build on our strengths, so we're not just reliant on, uh, on, on uh, mineral wealth, and uh, we need to adapt to a low emissions future. I mean, that is the future and it's how we as a nation move towards that. And we've got the talent and the expertise and the smarts to be able to do it. It's now about putting it into action. So this is certainly, uh, we believe, behind the government's push to support uh, entrepreneurs in the space, uh, to push for uh, modern manufacturing uh, as part of the situation. And this is part of the National Reconstruction Fund uh, push behind uh, manufacturing and creating those manufacturing uh, areas. And the medical products, medical products, if you like, has been identified as a key priority. Uh, and I, I suppose it's great that it's a priority area, but the funding around that is disjointed. So we're saying, let's understand what we've got, let's understand what we need, and then let's put a plan in place that not only sets out exactly where we need to reach uh, with the opportunity for our medical uh, products, uh, but then what is our what is our workforce? So what we're saying is. If we want to get the most out of government's investments in medical products and leverage private capital, uh, we need a plan. We need a national medical products industry plan that says this is where we need to be and this is how we're going to get there. So we see the identification of medical products as a priority under the National Reconstruction Fund as just the first step. It's how we put that into action moving forward. Part of what's needed is understanding the skill sets that we need to take forward in creating the workforce of the future. So we've got, you know, we've got the strategy, we've got the plans. It is who do we need to be able to drive those economic outcomes and actually bring those skills to bear in the sectors that we actually need. You know, we've got a health workforce that is under extreme pressure. We've got our clinicians, we've got our researchers, uh, we've got our early and mid-career researchers that are now considering whether or not, uh, you know, following a career in health medical research is something that would be useful for them and that's pretty concerning. We're talking, we surveyed uh, our health and medical research workforce a couple of years ago to find that two-thirds of health and medical researchers are saying, yep, this is not the uh, sector for me, we're, we're looking to, to move on. 
uh, from this particular area. And that's really concerning because it's not just about having those health and medical researchers working in health and medical research, but it's those critical skills that they bring to bear outside of health and medical research. So it is about really understanding and designing the workforce of the future that we need. When we think about exponential technological growth, things like artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, uh, what is the workforce of the future that we need, not only to take care of us uh, on an, as an aging population, but to drive the new economies of the future. And we have uh, some latent areas of those skills existing in Australia, but how do we really support and drive uh, those incredibly specialist skills to say we're creating a high value uh, economy uh, with high value jobs that really set us up to be a country that has a role to play in the global supply chain in an area that we already have that capability, uh, which is health and medical research innovation.